first of all, congratulations to all of you. You know, here it is, one of the nicer, you know, evenings we have had here, you know, in town, you know, and you're taking time off in the middle of the week to come, come out here and listen to a lawyer babble on for, for an hour about how to set up a nonprofit business. That is my background. I mean, Linda did a very nice job of, of introducing me, but she kind of played down the L word, you know, the lawyer, which most people do. I am a lawyer. I am a small business attorney. I've been doing this now for 35 years of my life. All I do is help people start and run businesses of their own, uh, both for-profit and nonprofit. The main difference between you and most of my clients, you are intending to form a nonprofit business. That's the difference. Most of my clients want to start out doing a for-profit business, which ends up becoming a not-for-profit business. You guys are starting out with the intention of forming a non-profit business, which is the right way to go about this. Uh, you are the do-gooders of this world. Uh, and by the way, that is, I'm not just saying that, you know, just to get a cheap laugh. This program has a very interesting history. I've been doing this program now for 15 years on and off, you know, not just here, but around the country. Um, and about 10, 15 years ago, I maybe was doing this program once every two years. Now I'm doing it once every two months. There is a huge interest now in setting up nonprofits, and especially among the millennial uh, generation. I see we have a couple of people here that I think qualify, although I, I can never tell. You know, I mean, this guy may be 70 years old. He just had a good life. You know, I, I just, I, I can't, I, I never try to judge, you know, from the way people look. You know, it just, it doesn't work that way. Uh, but seriously, I am legal counsel, among many things, uh, I am legal counsel to the Student Entrepreneur Center at a local university. This is an, an organization that's trying to get some of the business school students and actually create entrepreneurial companies uh, as part of their academic program. And they're all, I, I, I love them all. They, they all want to be entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship is the big thing now. When I was a boy, you grew up wanting to be a doctor or a lawyer. Today, you want to be an entrepreneur. You want to be the next Mark Zuckerberg. But if you're a millennial, you want to be an entrepreneur, but you want to be nonprofit too. You want to be a nonprofit billionaire. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, who does good. Of course, Mark Zuckerberg does a lot of good anyway. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about him, per se. He's a lot richer than I am, and he has good lawyers. Um, so I'm not about to say anything bad about him. But, but seriously, they want to do well, but they also want to do good, which is an admirable goal. Uh, so how do you do this? OK, first of all, um, as you can see from the slide, normally I co-present this with somebody else, a young lady named Kim Kaiser. And that is a name you should write down. Um, Kim is wonderful. I have known Kim now for the better part of two decades. Uh, she is what is called a fundraising consultant or a fundraising uh, strategist. She works with nonprofits literally around the globe to help them develop their fundraising strategy. And she has worked with hundreds, literally, of nonprofits around the globe, uh, from major you know, institutions, household names that you would recognize, to people just starting out. She's based in New Rochelle, New York. I'll sing her praises just a little bit uh, later on. She unfortunately was not able to attend tonight, uh, in tonight's program, but she and I have done this so much that we can virtually, you know, we, we finish each other's sentences. That's how long we've been doing this together. Um, but it's a very good person to know. Because when you set up a nonprofit, one of the things you're going to find is you spend 90% of your time fundraising and raising money. That's what you spend 90% of your time doing. If you're starting a nonprofit, you are committing to become very good at that activity. Uh, and anybody who could help you get better at it is somebody that you need to know. And Kim is, is, as far as I know, one of the best, if not the best, in this area. So let's get started. First of all, now do you, now do you believe I'm a lawyer? Okay, there you go. This is the, the ugly disclaimer slide. We always use this at the beginning of every presentation. Really, most of this stuff is garbage, but, but there's one thing you just do need to know. Even though I know you do have questions, I am going to be talking about some legal stuff tonight, um, and I will try to answer as many legal questions as uh, I can, possibly. Um, I, none of the things that I'm saying tonight should be construed as one-on-one -on -one advice. There's a big difference between being given giving information and giving advice. Giving in, information is, this is how the law works. Giving advice is, this is what you should do. And there's a very big difference between those two things. I don't know any of you well enough to really know exactly what you should do, how you should set up your nonprofit. Uh, for me to get involved in that, I would have to get to know you a lot better uh, and actually be your attorney to help you set up this thing. So just be aware of that. Having said that, the information will be very good. You know, but just be very careful. Do not rely on anything I say on, on this program as something you actually should do. Okay, let's talk about nonprofits. The thing you have to know about nonprofits, the government does not make it easy for you to form nonprofits. The government is your biggest obstacle when you are trying to set up a nonprofit. And why is that? I mean, first of all, that sounds so cynical. 
And especially now with the election this year, you know, something I think there's just a lot of people who are just totally cynical about government in general. But I'm not just saying that to be cynical. When you are forming a nonprofit, what you are doing, you are asking the government for permission to do something very interesting. You're, you're, you're asking the government for permission not to pay taxes. You're asking the government for permission not only not to pay taxes, but to help other people get deductions from their taxes for the contributions and donations that they make to you. And the government is not going to just hand those things out like candy. You know, it's not like tickets to a rock show. They're going to make, they're going to throw some, some obstacles at you that you're going to have to, you know, not insurmountable obstacles, but there will be obstacles. You are not engaged, you're not asking for something that is easy for the government to say yes to, okay? Um, nonprofit organizations are difficult, they are time consuming to set up, and they do require discipline, okay? They, the government does not grant these lightly. Uh, you cannot engage in certain activities. So for example, if you're doing a 501c3, uh, a public charity, you cannot engage in political activity of any kind unless you are a lobbying organization. You know, if that's your sole or exclusive purpose, that's different. But if you're a 501c3, you cannot engage in political life. You can't support candidates. You can't, um, you know, get involved in electoral activities. Okay, that's just one. Remember, there's lots of rules to remember. There's lots of reports to file. Um, for, I always tell people, you do not have to have a nonprofit to do good. For-profit companies can and do a lot of good. Ben and Jerry's donate, and Newman's Own donate a very large percentage of their annual income to charity each year, and yet they are, a non, they are for profit organizations. These are not nonprofits. They are not 501c3. A, there is nothing wrong, illegal, immoral, or fattening, for a for profit company to put a clause in its charter saying um, each year the corporation shall donate at least X percent of its net profits to such charities as the board of directors may determine in their sole discretion. Period. It's the simplest thing to do, and in a lot of the cases, you are getting to the exact same place you would get um, you know, with a nonprofit organization. Let me just ask you to point back. If you start a nonprofit from scratch, what is the likelihood that you will be able to match the 1% don the donation that Facebook makes to charity every year, 1% of their net income? It's going to take a long time, isn't it, before you get to that 1%. So sometimes the best way to do good in this world is to do a for-profit corporation, not the cover off the ball, and then donate a percentage of your, of your proceeds to charity um, you know, uh, as, as set forth in your charter. Uh, that can be the best thing you can do. You avoid all the hassles. The only thing is, if you are for-profit, you cannot take tax-deductible donations. That is the one rigid inflexible rule. Only 501c3 public charities can do that. They can take tax-deductible. Anything else we're talking about today you may be exempt from taxes, but you do not, are not able to take tax-deductible donations. Only a 501c3 can do that. When in doubt, make it a for-profit business. It's a lot easier, it's a lot less expensive. Just to give you an idea, I mean, forgive me, this is gonna sound a little bit like an ad and I apologize for that, uh, but to give you an idea, my fee for setting up a nonprofit, and I'm one of the few attorneys in Connecticut that will do this for a flat fee. My flat fee for setting up a nonprofit is $2,000 plus another $1,000 in filing fees. So that gives you an idea, and I'm probably the cheapest game in town that I know of. You know, there may be other people out there doing it cheap. Unless you can find an attorney who'll do it pro bono, that is about you know, three to $5,000 is probably the budget that you should be starting with to set up a, a new nonprofit from scratch. You can, you, uh, setting up a for-profit business is gonna be a lot less expensive than that. Okay, so let's talk about nonprofits now. There are three types of nonprofit businesses, okay? Uh, actually, I want to go back and say something, because I want to say something. There's something here that's not on the slide. There is a third option now, and it's something that's relatively new. Uh, Connecticut and New York have just adopted these uh, by statute within the last two years. Some of you have heard about it. It's something called the Benefit Corporation or the B Corp. I don't have a slide on that yet on, for, on this program. I really should. A Benefit Corporation, a B Corp, is somewhere in the middle between a for-profit and a not-for-profit corporation. A benefit corporation is a corporation that sets up as a for-profit corporation, but that elects a social purpose as well as a for-profit purpose. And if it is set up the right way, the board of directors in making decisions has to balance both the social purpose and the for-profit purpose, okay? Um, frankly, I have formed a couple 
I think they are very risky right now only because we don't have a lot of case law and rules explaining to us exactly when the board of just, uh, directors will be justified in going one way versus another. I tend to steer my clients away from benefit corporations right now only because we don't have the answers to a lot of our questions on those. Um, yeah, frankly, I, I think that for the same benefit that you would get with a benefit corporation, you could set up a for-profit corporation and simply put that provision in the charter about donating a certain percentage of profits to charity. You get to the same place with a lot less risk. If I'm a director of a benefit corporation and there's a conflict between my social purpose and what my shareholders want me to do, how do I resolve that conflict? Well, the statute sets out guidelines and rules that I must follow in making that determination, but if I make the wrong one, I could probably get sued. And I hate to say it, but we're probably gonna have to see a few legal cases like that before we know exactly um, whether, you know, how, how the courts are gonna treat these things. Also, too, keep in mind the Benefit Corporation so far is not a tax-exempt organization. Okay, that's the other thing you have to know. The IRS, at least at the time this video was being done, spring of 2016, uh, has not yet ruled on uh, the tax exemption for benefit corporations. Right now, if you're doing a benefit corporation, a B Corp, it is taxed as a for-profit entity. Okay, so keep that in mind if you're gonna do a benefit corp. So some of you guys I know are gonna ask for that. Now let's talk about real nonprofit businesses, not the for-profits that, that elect a charitable donation, not the benefit corps or the B Corps, these are now, we're talking about nonprofits. There are three kinds. There are organizations that benefit only their members. There are public charities, which are 501c3 organizations. And there are private foundations. Let's talk about the differences. Let's talk about organizations that benefit only their members. Labor unions, chambers of commerce, alumni and social clubs. Um, a couple of years ago, I incorporated uh, uh, my uh, local alumni club. You know, it's a social organization. We're all alumni of the same, we went to the same college, you know, at different times. And we do some, a lot of activities. Some of them are charitable, some of them are not. You know, we always have a big dinner every year. Um, you know, we, we do a hike through Lake Mohegan every year, cleaning up after people's dogs. I try to be, I try to excuse myself from that one, uh, <laughs> if I can. I do other things for them that are charitable, but that one I try to stay away from for obvious reasons. Um, but we are not there to benefit the public. We are only there for our members. You, in order to be a member of this association, uh, you have to be a graduate of this college or one of its affiliated you know, schools. Uh, that's how you get into this organization. So we are not a 501c3 charity. We are not benefiting the public there. Um, if you are doing one of these, you, must, you, you still have to apply to the IRS to get a tax exemption for your organization, which we did for my alumni club. But that's all you get. You only get the exemption from taxes. You don't get the ability to take tax deductible donations. Only the 501c3 gives you that. Whenever you're forming a nonprofit, you're looking to get two benefits from the government. You wanna be exempt from paying taxes, and you want the, if you're a 501c3, you want the ability to be able to take tax deductible donations that people, your donors, can deduct on their tax returns. This organization will not do that. It will only give you an exemption from taxes. You must specify the criteria for membership benefits. How do you determine if somebody's a member or not? Okay, that has to be all spelled out in your application when you file for the IRS exemption. And they are exempt from taxes, but usually cannot accept tax deductible donations, although they all try to. Okay, everybody does. If you made a donation to your alumni club, you are probably gonna try to donate it on your taxes, even though you probably can't do that. The amounts are usually so small, nobody cares but technically you're not supposed to do that. Okay, now let's talk about the one you came to learn about. This is the 501c3, public charity. Here are the rules. Must benefit the general public or a specified group that is fairly open-ended. So Vietnam War veterans, people afflicted with a particular disease, that kind of thing. Okay, you can, you know, that, that is the basic thing. Uh, some of you may remember some of you older people back during the days right after the Vietnam War, a number of people tried to set up organizations to benefit Vietnam veterans, and there was a big discussion about whether that meant only veterans who had actually served in combat in Vietnam or veterans who had served during the Vietnam War period. So somebody stationed in Kansas from 1968 through 1974 was a Vietnam era veteran, but he was not technically a Vietnam veteran because he didn't, he didn't go wandering through the rice paddies with a rifle, rifle over his head. You know, he didn't qualify. That person did not qualify. There's a big dispute about that back then. Um, th this, is, this comes right out of 501c3. It must be organized and operated exclusively for religious, charitable, scientific, testing for public safety. That's like underwriters laboratories, if you know who they are. 
literary or educational, or to foster national or international amateur sports, or prevention of cruelty for children, cruelty to children, I should say. Uh, cruelty for children, I think, is probably a good thing. Uh, but cruelty to children is not a good thing. Um, to children or animals. It, when you apply to the IRS, you have to shoehorn it into one of these categories. So for example, one of the, um, a couple of years ago, I had a cat fight with the IRS. Um, I was setting up a nonprofit. It was a, a website that was doing daily Bible readings. They had daily readings from the Old and New Testament. Now I tried to qualify it as a religious organization. Sounds pretty obvious, right? But they took the position that a religious organization is more like a church. And this organization was not doing uh, services. They didn't have a doctrine. There were no, you know, preaches. No preaching was going on on this site. It was just a Bible's information site. And there were people, it was actually social, it was actually kind of interesting, social media where scholars would contribute on like the origins of various Bible verses and stuff like that. So I was able to recast it as an educational organization and then it got through. You know, even though it was dealt with the Bible, the IRS took the position that it was more an educational organization than a religious one. You got to be careful which silo you, you apply for when you go in. No membership required. You do not have to have members. In fact, most 501c3s do not have members at all. But, they, but if you do have, um, you know, but, you, but if you're specifying a certain group, you do have to define what that group is. Our, these, these, these 501c3s are exempt from taxes and they can accept taxable deductions. This is the only thing that gets you both of those benefits, the only ones we talk about. Last but not least, private foundations. So for example, some of you know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the guy who founded Microsoft does a lot of good. These are really, they don't have any public, they have a public purpose, but they don't take money from the public. That's what a private foundation, private foundations are funded solely by wealthy individuals, their families, or by businesses. So for example, for many years, there was uh, the Olin Foundation. Uh, Olin Corporation had a foundation that promoted uh, shooting sports around the world. That was one of their big things. So that was one of their big things. Um, the, pu the purpose is public, but the, donate, the source of funding was not public. That's what a private foundation is. Private foundations are exempt from tax, but guess what? You cannot accept tax deductible donations. And with a private foundation, you don't care. People who do private foundations are looking to put their name on something. So if you underwrite a scholarship, uh, you know, the, the, the Cliff and Mary Jones, uh, you know, uh, scholarship foundation to, uh, to sponsor a, scholar, you know, a scholarship for young needy students at your local university, that's going to be a private foundation, that trust. It's probably not going to be, you won't be, you won't get a 501c3 status for that. But you don't care. That's not really what you're trying to accomplish with that kind of an organization. Okay, so you've decided on what, that you do want to be a nonprofit. You don't want to be a for-profit that just does good. You want to be a nonprofit. You've decided now which of the three nonprofit types you're going to be. Either a, um, you know, an organization that benefits just its members, a public charity, or a private foundation. Now, step one, you've got to put together your board of directors. Most nonprofits do not have owners or members. They do not have shareholders. They may have members but they don't have shareholders per se. Um, nonprofits are almost always governed by a board of directors. Sometimes you call it a board of trustees. Still the same thing, okay? And this is one of the most important decisions you make. These are the people who are gonna run the day-to-day -day activities of the nonprofit. And you need two things here. You need people with a passion for your mission. I mean, that goes without saying. Th that's the easy part. But you also need people that will have e expertise in an area that will be helpful to the nonprofit entity as well. Look for business experience, giving experience, leadership skills, fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. You're gonna hear me say this till you're sick. You gotta have somebody on your board that knows how to raise money and who knows what dialing for dollars is all about, calling up wealthy people and, and handling them for money. You gotta have people on your board who are comfortable doing that. Obviously, all people should be there. Um, average board size is five to seven board members uh, and one or two staff positions. Be careful not to overlayer yourself with staff. That's a mistake that a lot of nonprofits uh, do. What they do is they have a five-person board, they have an executive director, and that executive uh, director has three minions, you know, the little guys with the one eye and stuff like that, running around, you know, the yellow guys, uh, running around, you know, doing all the day-to-day -day stuff. But be careful about overlaying yourself with management because these people all have to get paid, okay? Pop quiz here. What is the first challenge that every nonprofit faces? What is the very first Thing that nonprofits 
have to have a challenge. What's the first hurdle that a nonprofit has to overcome to be successful? Cover costs. Cover costs. It has to make a profit. The first challenge every nonprofit organization has is to make a profit. Just because you're nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make a profit. If you don't make a profit, you can't cover your costs uh, and be successful. And when your biggest cost, obviously, is payroll. You know, a, a, a nonprofit business has to cover its costs just like any for-profit business does. The only difference is that in a for-profit business, whatever's left over is distributed to the shareholders as a dividend. For a nonprofit, by law, it must be plowed back into whatever the charitable or exempt purpose of the organization is. That's the, that's the only difference between a for-profit and a nonprofit when it comes to making money. Both must make money in order to survive. Um, you want board members who can engage with fundraising. It's crucial all the time but especially in the early stages of organization development. Set up your board terms, limit and renewal terms from the get-go so people know what is expected, okay? You can expect that someone's gonna say, well, okay, I really would love to do this, I believe in the mission, I wanna help out here, but what if I get sued? You know, what's gonna happen there? We'll talk about that a little bit later. You have to have a good answer because people worry about that. You know, I'm, I'm very leery of serving on nonprofit boards sometimes, especially people that are doing things that might be a little aggressive or confrontational, um, because I don't really know what my liability and my ex personal exposure is going to be. You've got to make sure that they feel comfortable with that. We'll talk about that a little bit here. Now, next thing, so you got your board of directors. Now plan your operating budget. Think through what the first one to three years, when you apply to the IRS for 501c3 status, you have to do a, a three-year projection. You have to do an income statement and a balance sheet projecting forward three years what you think is going to happen with this. And you have to be reasonable about it. Uh, that's part of what I do with my clients is I help give you guidance and ideas as to how you do that. Uh, it's called part nine of the application. Part nine always deals with finances and it's the hardest part of the, of the application form to do. I'll give you some suggestions for that later on. How much money do you need to do what you want to do? Here's what I always tell people. Whenever you're doing, whenever you're doing an operating budget, the first thing you do is you project your costs. What are you going to have to spend money on for the next one, two, three years? Do, really do your homework there. You know, really think through everything. Do not forget professional fees. Lawyers, accountants, people don't always do, do work pro bono, uh, even for nonprofits. You know, project forward one, two, three years, add another 10, 15, 20% because you're always going to overlook something, and then figure out how much donations do you need, how many donations do you need, and what size ranges to cover those expenses for the first one, two, three years, and is it feasible? So if you come to me with, a, with an operating budget saying, well, we're going to need to spend at least $100,000 uh, in startup costs for the next, you know, one, two, three years. Uh, but we figure out that we, if we get at least 300 donations of $10,000 each, we should be okay. How likely is it that you are going to get 300 donations of $10,000 each for a startup non It's not going to happen, people. I hate to tell you. Not unless you are well connected with the 1%, in which case, you know, if you're single, I want to speak to you. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you've got that kind of money lying around, I want to know who you are, okay? I'm only, I'm only kidding. Um, how much money do you need? Get estimates for the costs of things you aren't familiar with. Do not guess. The biggest mistake that people make when they start up, uh, actually, to be honest with you, any startup business, for-profit or non-profit, they underestimate the startup costs. It always takes more money to get a non-profit or for-profit off the ground than anybody expects. Um, that's why I say, do your best guess and then attack on another 10, 15, 20 percent because whenever, when you start the thing up, you will find that there are other expenses you didn't think about. So do some planning for that. Now, plan your fundraising strategy. How are you going to fund the nonprofit? Are you going to rely mostly on donations from individuals? Are you going to be do doing government grants? Um, you know, who are you going to solicit to be donors? Well, <laughs> most of you are looking at me saying, yeah, rich people. Okay, well, define that for me, please. You know, I don't, don't just leave it with rich people. Who are these people? What are they? Are they members of certain professions? Are they people in certain income ranges? Are they male? Are they female? Are they middle-aged? Are they younger? Are they fellow millennials? What are they? Describe these people to me. Uh, who will do the soliciting? How are you going to do it? Is it going to be uh, the, in, your, in your application for 501c3 status, you will be required to spell out exactly how you're going to raise money, what your fundraising strategy is going to be. Are you going to do concerts, you know, benefit events you know, to raise money? Are you going to do bingo nights, in which case you've got to worry about the anti-gambling laws? Um, you know, what are you going to do? List those activities. How are you going to raise the money? Bake sales? 
The IRS wants to know what you're going to do, what you're going to do, and they want to make sure that your, your strategy is reasonable. This is where somebody like Kim Kaiser comes in very, very handy because she helps you look at your organization and says, well, okay, for an organization like yours, I wouldn't do this. I would, uh, you're much better off doing that because X, Y, and Z. That's the kind of consulting you need from somebody like a Kim Kaiser. Um, the important thing is you want to be realistic, but you also want to project to a positive image. An organization that's only projecting $10,000 a year for the next three or four years is not gonna be a very exciting thing to sell to, other, to, sell to potential donors and other people. Okay. Also, too, if you are relying upon government grants, make sure you have someone on your team that knows how to write government grants. That is a real art. Seducing the government out of hard-earned tax money. That is a real, that's an art. And then, by the way, people give courses on it, too. We'll talk about that a little bit later. You can actually take courses in grant writing uh, here in Connecticut. We'll talk about that. Okay, now, so now you, you've got yourself set up. You've done your operating budget, your business plan. You have your board of directors set up. Now you have to form a corporation. Now here's where I am a little bit, what's the word? Um, this is where I have my own opinion here, okay? You can have a nonprofit that's just an unincorporated association. You can use an LLC, but I think it's a bad idea. It's a, it's a bad idea. It is much better to set up what's called in this state a non-stock corporation. In other states, it's called a not-for-profit corporation. The IRS likes corporations better than they do LLCs. Your, your application for tax-exempt status is much more likely to, fl to fly through the pro system if you are set up as a corporation. It makes it a lot easier, too. With corporations, the statute takes care of everything. It tells you what officers you should have, what titles they have to have, and all this. With LLCs, you have to make everything up from whole cloth. It, 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 it doubles your startup costs for a nonprofit. For a for-profit business, LLCs are usually less expensive to form than corporations. For nonprofits, it's exactly the opposite. Corporations are much easier to set up, and the IRS likes it. It's what they're used to. It's what they're used to seeing. And it also does afford a little better protection against liability, especially for your nonprofit directors. Keep in mind that if you are in Connecticut, okay, this is just for Connecticut folks here, we're a weird state. In most states, you only have to file a certificate of incorporation to set up a nonprofit corporation. Here in Connecticut, you have two documents you have to file. And one of the biggest way, uh, reasons the IRS rejects your 501c3 application is because you didn't enclose a copy of the second document. Believe it or not, it's that simple. Uh, it's the certificate of incorporation, there's a $50 fee. Uh, we have something called an organization and first report. That's the, organ that's the document that spells out who your directors and your officers are. And that's $150. Religious corporations only have to file the certificate of incorporation, but they're the only exemption uh, from that. Okay, so now you have your corporation, you got your board of directors, you know who the officers are gonna be, the people are all in the right boxes. Now you have to go for the federal tax uh, exemption. If you're, if you're going for 501c3 status, public charity status, you file IRS form 1023. Uh, go to, uh, if you want to find these forms, by the way, they're all, they're all on the web. You go to irs.gov. Make sure it's irs.gov, by the way. Do not go to irs.com. It's a porn site. I, I am serious. All the government agencies, if you go to the dot-coms, they're usually nasty sites. They don't, don't go there. It's irs.gov. I'm serious about that. Uh, and they do, and why do you think they do that? You know, yeah. IRS.gov, and then when you go to the search box, do Form 1023, and you, it'll give you the form, the instructions, all this stuff is public. If you are doing anything else, if you're doing an organization that benefits only its members, the first category, or a private foundation, you use uh, Form 1024, okay? But the 501c3 is Form 1023. You must attach a ton of stuff. The IRS judges your application by how thick it is. Okay, that sounds so funny, but it really isn't. When I do an application, I throw in the kitchen sink. I throw in brochures, newsletters. I throw everything at the IRS. I want them to see this is for real. This isn't just, this isn't just a bunch of wannabes sitting around a table at a local library. These are people who are actually making things happen, dude. And this, this should go to the top of the pile. You know, that's what I want. That's the message I want them to get. So your organizational documents, by the way, when you do a non-stock corporation, the IRS requires that certain language be in there. Make sure there are certain provisions that the IRS expects to be in there. And if it's not in there, you will bounce. And there are about five of them that the IRS wants in there. Uh, when I do it, this, when, make sure you use a lawyer when you form the non-stock corporation. If for no other reason than that they know what those five things are that the IRS wants to see. 
you want to say you want to see an operating budget for at least the next two years. This is now three years, by the way. They just changed this last year. They want to see a three-year forward-looking projection, income uh, statement and balance sheet, current balance sheet, and newsletters, anything that will help them understand what you are doing, how you are raising funds, uh, what your fundraising strategy is. They want to see things that your members and your donors are going to see. They want to, they want to look at this from their point of view and say, okay, is this a public charity or not? Okay, um, you have to pay a non-refundable user fee uh, for 501c3 organizations with less than $10,000 in annual receipts. It's $400. Uh, above that, it's $850. By the way, remember I said that the filing fees were uh, could be as much as $1,000. This is where most of it goes. Uh, the IRS uh, application fee, uh, the 1023 fee for organ for larger charities is $850. Always, always respect, request expedited handling. There's a cover letter that needs to be included that says, we really need you to approve this fast because we've got people champing at the bit to give us money, and we're going to lose a lot of these people if we don't hear from you at least in the next couple of months. If you don't do that, you go to the bottom of the pile. The IRS is currently swamped right now. Uh, I spoke to somebody last week. They're down in Louisville, Kentucky, the, the, the branch of the IRS that does this. They said, three years ago, we were getting one application for tax-exempt status a week. Now they are getting 50 a week, and they haven't increased their staff. So it takes a long time to get the IRS just to focus. You want to make sure when the application goes in, the application is perfect. No mistakes, no boxes left blank, everything checked. You must be compulsive, OCD, about this. Is if you miss one blank, that's going to give the IRS reason to reject you and set you back by weeks in your application process, and you don't want that. If your attorney or accountant is filing the application, many of us do this, you also have to include IRS Form 2848, which is a power of attorney form, you know, which you definitely want to sign because you want me talking to those people, not you. Okay? And I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay? Make sure your application is 100 complete when you file it. If the application is incomplete or if they have questions, they almost always do, they will send letters requesting additional information and they must be responded to within 10 days. So when you get a letter from the IRS saying, we're looking at your, at your, at your application, we, we want to know more about this, 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 you drop what you're doing, you call your attorney or your accountant and you get that information turned around. Otherwise, guess what? You go to the bottom of the pile. Is what you don't get rejected, but you go to the bottom of the pile. And the pile is very, very deep right now. You can withdraw your application at any time, but the user fee, the 400 or the 850, is non-refundable. You lose that. But they don't penalize you. you know, if you make a mistake, I had a situation a couple of years ago where an organization was formed, and then the government got involved and set up its own uh, organization to do the same thing. So there was really no reason for my client to exist, and we had to withdraw the application. No problem at all. No penalty, no anything, but they, but they lost their, their 850 bucks. Okay? If the application is complete and everything's fine, they will issue a determination letter granting exemption within 180 days of receipt of your application. I will tell you right now, the IRS very rarely issues determination letters less than 180 days. If your application goes in and it's perfect, you're going to be waiting at least four to six months to get your determination letter. And that's just because they are so utterly swamped. Uh, if they, and by the way, if they send you questions, that adds to the, one, that adds to the 180. All right. So if the so if you so if you're waiting two months from the and the IRS hasn't said anything to you, you get a question letter. Okay. You respond within ten days. You now have they now have 180 days from that date to grant yeah to, to grant the uh, the determination letter. Every time you get a question letter, it adds to uh, it tolls the the 180 day period. Okay. Make now when you do get the determination letter. By the way, it should be one of the happiest days of your life. When you get a determination letter from the IRS saying, yep, you're exempt, you can take tax deductible donation, you should go out and celebrate. But before you do, and I tell this to all my clients, take this letter, go to a Kinko's or a UPS store, any place where they do bulk copying, right, and make 500 copies of this letter. I am serious. I am serious because everybody in the world is going to want a copy of this. Whenever you, and you're a nonprofit and you do business with the outside world, the only, they, they need proof that you are truly a nonprofit. And the only proof you have is the determination letter. If you give somebody your only original of that letter, 
it's going to take months to get a duplicate letter back from the IRS. Seriously, this is the best advice you will get. This is one piece of advice I'm happy to give you. Make tons of copies of this thing. Make tons. It's only two pages, so it won't cost you a lot. Make a thousand copies because you're going to end up giving copies of this to everybody you deal with. Um, seriously, that's the, that's the, the biggest one, a big mistake that people make is that they run out of copies of the determination letter and they're calling me asking for a duplicate. Well, usually I do keep duplicate copies. If I'm the one who, who formed it for you, I, I do keep duplicates, but don't ever, don't lose that sucker because you need it. Okay. So now you got your federal approval. Congratulations. Now the last step is you have to apply for your state tax exemption. Now for the people on the video here, um, we're in, we're in the state of Connecticut. Uh, if your state has an income tax, um, you cannot assume that the federal exemption automatically exempts you from state taxes. Once you get your federal exemption, you usually have to file a document with your state tax authority by which you will get an exemption from your state income, sales, use, taxes, whatever kind of taxes they have. The practice varies from state to state. What I would recommend is go to your state tax authority website and in the search box, click on exempt organizations. Uh, search for exempt organizations. They probably have a page up that tells you what you have to do uh, to get exemption from your state and local taxes once you have the federal 501c3 exemption. Okay, Here in Connecticut, it's very simple. You have to file form REG1 with Connecticut and attach a copy of your determination letter. You do that, exemption is automatic. Uh, they, they don't question it. As long as you have the federal determination letter and you file their form, they will give you a state tax exemption number but they no longer give out exemption certificates the way they used to. Uh, that's something they, years ago, they used to give out an exemption certificate. They don't do this anymore, but you will get a number that you can use when, for example, you're ordering food, you're, you know, your caterer for your annual dinner, that kind of thing. Employment taxes, the exemption is automatic, but, and this is one of the little gotchas in Connecticut, you still have to pay unemployment compensation if you have employees. If you don't have W-2 employees, if it's all volunteers, no worries. But the minute you hire one or two employees, you, you don't have to pay the federal payroll taxes, the FICA, the FUDA, the Medicare. You don't have to do that, but you do have to pay unemployment compensation to the Department of Labor. Um, that's unfortunately one of the gotchas in Connecticut. Now let's talk about sales and use tax. So now you've got this organization, you have a fundraising event, you get a caterer, the caterer shows up with all the food, and the first thing he wants is, I've got to charge you sales tax, show me proof of your exemption. Okay, what's the first thing you're going to give him? The determination letter. That's where you got to get one of your 500 copies. That's why you want, seriously, you want millions of copies of that thing because you're going to be giving them out to everybody. Okay. Uh, but you also, in Connecticut, you have to file form CERT119. -E 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 Go to the Connecticut Department of Revenue Services website, type that number into the search box, and you'll see the form with all the instructions. It's not that hard. Um, you know, uh, some, it, basically it's a certificate in which you are swearing, it's an affidavit where you're swearing that your organization is tax exempt, okay? If, if we're talking about meals or lodging, it's form CERT 112, okay? Now here's the thing, if you go on the website, Connecticut has 10 different exemption forms for nonprofits, depending on, there's one for gasoline, believe it or not. You go to your gas station, you're driving the van, you know, the, for whatever, the church or whatever it is you're doing, right? Every time you go to a gas station, you walk in and you got to give a copy of that form to the guy, you know, the, the, the teenager that's sitting behind the, uh, the thing with a cell phone and stuff like that, because otherwise he has to charge a sales tax. Okay, Connecticut has like 10 forms for this. A lot of states only have like one or two. We have 10. And you're gonna be, you're gonna know all of them by heart. So we, if I see you a year from now and I talk, well, for this you need a CERT 115, you're gonna know exactly what I'm talking about. That, that's, that's how bad it's gonna get. Okay, Connecticut just is weird with this stuff. Um, and now, now here's what you can do. You may sell goods. Now, what about, what about things like bake sales or stuff like that? Let's say that you're doing a flea market. Okay, well, generally speaking, even though you're non-exempt, you are required to pay sales tax in that one instance where you have a, a, a flea market or something where you are selling goods. You with me on this? Connecticut's weird this way. Um, but you can do up to five one-day fundraising events each year without collecting sales tax. If you're, doing a, a, if you're doing a flea market every month, the IRS is going to look at that and they're going to say, that is not part of your exempt purpose here. You're, you're really like an eBay's vendor or something like that. You're, you're a flea market here. That is not an exempt organization. 
and they will question that. So just keep that little number in mind. If you're just doing five, four, three or four, two or three of these things a year, you know, a lot of churches, for example, have like fun days, you know, in the spring or in the fall, you know, where people come out and they got the bouncing castle and all that where the kids can play and stuff like that. As long as you're only doing one or two of those a year, you're not going to have a problem with this. If you're doing one every month, the, the, the state might have a question about that for sales tax. Personal property taxes, um, every four, if, you're, if your nonprofit owns real property, if you have a building or a house that is exempt from the property taxes, you are required to file an exemption statement every four years with the tax assessor's office in each town where you own property. You do not have to file the first one when you form the organization, although I recommend that you do. If you are forming an organization that has a clubhouse or something, um, you know, a religious organization that say that has a, a social club where kids can play and do stuff like that, make sure that you file that exemption certificate because that sets that four-year clock running. Otherwise, somebody in your organization has to remember to file that thing after four years. Once you file with the tax assessor's office, they will send you reminders. So the sooner you do it, you're in the system now, so you will get the reminders every four years. Otherwise, somebody, or maybe your attorney, has to remember that four-year deadline. Last but not least, there's one more thing you have to do. Uh, the Connecticut Attorney, I'm sorry, the Department of Consumer Protection, if you are raising funds for your nonprofit, and duh, yes, you will, because all nonprofits do, right? Um, you have to... Um, you have to register with the Department of Consumer Protection as a charitable fundraiser. Now, the good news is it's just one piece of paper. You pay 50 bucks. That's it. I have never known anyone not to get this, but you must do it. If you register a nonprofit with DRS and you don't do this, you will get a very nasty letter from Consumer Protection within 30 days saying, hey, how come you haven't registered with us? And as long as you go online and do it you know, the next day, you'll usually be okay. But you don't want to get nasty letters from government agencies when you're starting a nonprofit. Okay, all paid solicitors and some fundraising counsel. Now, normally, I do not have to register as a charitable solicitor if all I'm doing is being your lawyer. But if I'm holding funds for the organization, if I'm putting money of yours in my trust account, and I'm helping manage your funds. Some, some attorneys do that. I personally don't, but some attorneys and accountants do. They are required uh, to register. Not only do they have to register, but they have to post a bond too, a surety bond. So they don't, you know, abscond with the money and head to Venezuela. Okay. So now let's talk about managing now. So that's the basic formation process. Step one, form a corporation. Step two, get your IRS exemption. Step three, get your state tax exemption, your exemption from state taxes. Okay. When you form a nonprofit, you have an annual report that you have to file, and you must, must, must file it on time. It is the one thing the IRS asks you to do, okay? If your gross receipts, and there's different forms depending on how big you are. If your gross receipts are 50000 or less, you file 990N. This is called the e-postcard. It's not a physical form. You just go online. You fill it out in five minutes. You tell them what your gross income was last year. You certify on a stack of Bibles. You, know, you have to swear under penalties of perjury that your gross receipts were less than 50000 And the IRS approves you, and you're good for another year. It's a no-brainer. Um, you can do it, and that's the website where you, where you do it. If your gross receipts are between fifty and 200000 and your total assets are less than five hundred, you can file Form 990EZ. Um, and by the way, May 15th is the deadline. Okay, they give you a month after your personal taxes to figure out all your 990 stuff. So just keep that in mind. And then if your gross receipts are 200000 or more or your assets are 500000 or more, you file the big form 990. 990 is a tough form. I would not do it myself. Uh, get an accountant to help you. The EZ and the postcard are, are very easy to do. Most organizations don't hire accounts to do that. But the 990 is just like filing an income tax return for a for-profit corporation. It's just as complicated. Uh, so get somebody to help you with that. Now, let's talk about compensating your team. If you are a 501c3, you are required to have a compensation policy for senior managers with an independent review of their compensation. Now, this is tricky. So let's say I have to use the three stooges here. Mo, Larry, and Curly are forming a nonprofit. Okay? Mo and Larry are the guys who are going to run everything. And by the way, the thought of Mo and Larry, any of the three students running a nonprofit is a scary proposition, okay? But Mo and Larry are going to be running the nonprofit. Curly's just, you know, somebody who believes in the mission. You know, he wants to help out. But he's not going to roll up his sleeves. He's got a day job, and he's not going to roll up his sleeves helping out. Curly becomes a very important guy once you get 501c3 status. So Mo and Larry at some point want to start paying themselves compensation. If you're a 501c3, 
Curley has to approve that because he is the non-interested director. You with me on that? Very important concept. When you're a 501c3, and this is not a problem when you're first starting out. When you're first starting out, you're not going to compensate yourself. You're not going to take a salary. But sooner or later, when this becomes more of a full-time thing, you are going to want to be compensated for it, and that's when you've got to bring in the disinterested director. Because uh, 501c3 requires that. You must have your compensation approved by someone who is not themselves an employee of the organization. Common sense if you think about it. You also have to have a conflicts of interest policy. So whenever the nonprofit is doing deals, let's say for example, um, you know, you, you form a nonprofit, I'm one of your directors, okay? And let's say my wife and I decide, you know what? We really want to leave Connecticut, but because Connecticut's in such crappy shape right now, our money, our house isn't worth anything. So why don't we do this? Let's give the house to the charity or we'll sell it to the charity for a buck. You know, we'll get a huge tax dedu deduction on our house. We'll thumb our nose at the state of Connecticut tax authorities and get the heck out of here. That transaction is what we call an interested director transaction, and that must be approved. You can do it, but it has to be approved by the non-interested directors. Okay? Whenever there's a transaction between the company and one of its directors, officers, or principals, that has to be approved by the non-interest. So that's why when you build your board, you got to have people on there who are not going to be part of the day-to-day -day operation of the business.